I'll tell you a bit about George and his uh, wonderful life. He was born in 1936 in the southwest corner of Greece in a village uh, surrounded by forests, basically in the middle of nowhere. And uh, this was obviously wartime. Uh, his father was in the army. Um, his father had an unusual experience of being instructed to kill his brother. So <clears throat> the civil war in Greece was a very terrible that time. He was definitely anti-war, always was that way. Uh, his mother was extremely practical, probably the most practical woman ever met. He lived till 105 or, or repeatedly 110, etc. And was independent to the end. He would get her own shopping, her own house, do her own washing, everything. And he insisted that it to be that way. Very stubborn. So he did have a partial stubborn side from his mother. Uh, he definitely liked his own set routines. Uh, and he had his comfort zones. Didn't really like being taken outside the comfort zone. But within that comfort zone, he had his family. And he gave everything he had, his whole entire heart to us, uh, to uh -huh. Eva, the love of his life, Eva. And uh, so after his farming days, uh, he uh, started studying accounting, or he did high school actually. And then they take him to the army. It's a uh, conscription in Greece. You know. And uh, he did an aptitude test in the army, and he was basically the highest scoring student they had. That uh, was thousands. Uh, his IQ is in the 160s, and he was constantly invited into Mensa. He had this uh, way of approaching extremely complex problems and finding the most elegant solutions to them. And uh, so any Sudoku or master chess problem, would just he would just see it and uh, beyond everyone's ability. I think the army saw that. And he actually didn't do any duty in the army. He didn't even hardly know how to hold a gun. They immediately took him to the administration, and um, he was uh, running the show. He uh, ran uh, the food and distri uh, distributions and logistics for the army. And it wasn't even like he was a trainee. He was a full uh, employee of the army. And he had all the, uh, what's the word, you know, uh, he could do anything he wanted. He could pull strings with friends there. I think that gave him a lot of confidence. He came out the army, finished his accounting. Uh, he was one of the best students in accounting. Started working as an accountant. Uh, he always wanted to explore. His parents were quite critical of him. Uh, his, his mother was a little bit nagging. Uh, he wanted a free life. He, he did like parties. Um, he hadn't settled down and he was in his mid-twenties. In Greece they put a lot of pressure on him to marry at a young age and have a family. And my dad was always a bit reluctant to do that. Uh, so he moved to Italy and then he moved to Austria. And then he came to Australia uh, in the mid-70s and uh, worked as an accountant there. And uh, he loved Australia. He also worked in a pizza shop in Canberra, part-time. And I think he started liking the fast food industry a bit more than the crunching numbers of accounting. Uh, so anyway, he went back to Greece, and uh, he was one of the best chess players in Greece. And he was in a chess club. And in that chess club, he met uh, my mother's uh, partner at that time. And they were playing chess games together, and they became good friends. And uh, through this man, uh, my dad met Eva. And uh, well, this man didn't really look after Eva, and uh, eventually they split up. Uh, <laughs> and my dad, it was love at first sight, because no doubt. Uh, after that, he uh, took her to restaurants where they would have their little forte cake together. Um, he was all wine and dine, 100% sweet and on And uh, so they got married. And, uh, yeah, shortly after, they conceived me. And uh, you know, they uh, came to Australia to start their life here. And uh, first, Things are uh, they open the Fishy Fair restaurant in Northridge, or um, part owners of that. Uh, did that for a while. The owner kind of uh, went uh, cuckoo, and they had to split up the Fishy Fair. Uh, soon after, the owner George Shishkabat for about eight nine years. Uh, George Shishkabat was great. Uh, we sold that. A couple of years later, we opened up the restaurant. Uh, now my dad had great regret about selling the Shishkabat place. It did depress him a little bit at times. He thought he made a really terrible decision for the family. 
But I think in all honesty, that is the correct thing. You know, we have this restaurant, we have all these wonderful people we've met from that. And uh, I think there should be no regrets in life. We should just be positive and thankful for everything we have right now. And uh, my dad at the end, he was very thankful for us all. Uh, he thought of me very proudly. He said he's power from the restaurant. He thought Eva was the most wonderful wife you could possibly imagine. Putting up with you know, all sorts of whinging and stuff, but he, he was a chronic whinger, uh, especially once he got sick. He was just oh, 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 oh. And um, yeah, we well, got used to that. He told me about 15 years ago or something, new call, I'm going to die soon. Yeah, so he was kind of always prepared me for this, um, but uh, as much as you could prepare someone, it's still devastating. He was uh, the most greatest philosopher I've known. Um, again, his uh, approach to seeing a complex problem and finding elegant, simple solutions. And when you, when you talk to him about life, as complex it is, he would say, Nick, don't drown in the teacup. Here is the way you should go. And it was always just so easy. You know? And uh, you have the general calmness when you talk about it. All your problems disappear and you realize like, hey, this ain't so bad as well, you know. The sun's gonna work, you know, rise up tomorrow and I'm still healthy and you've got to appreciate that. And uh, I, I know my dad would be anything to be healthy again. He uh, had a little bit of a drinking problem, uh, maybe not a problem, but kind of a product of always being very social, he was extremely outgoing, he loved partying. You know, it was the center of every party. And uh, unfortunately, uh, yeah, when you drink too much, you, you tend to have uh, people with failure and such. So he, fe he felt very bad about that. He regretted his drinking. Um, and uh, at the end, uh, I said to him, you shouldn't regret your drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, what mattered the most was that you were always there for us. And he always was there for us. Any problem it was, you come to him calmly with everything he could to solve that. He could barely stand up and um, he could remain conscious for like, you know, X hours a day, week out of it. He was still determined to make the butler buy and half the food at the restaurant to the end. Um, so yeah, everything he had he gave to us. And I'm sure if he was right now, he would be over the moon at the fact that he's coming out to celebrate his life. And uh, we need to think positively, we shouldn't be crying about it. He had a wonderful life. He only got to 81. The eight years of dialysis he went through, the average age is about three. He definitely went way longer than most people on that. He was an absolute bad one. And um, I, I have to thank particular people. I mean, like, mum, I, I can't thank you more. Like, the way you looked after him is just unbelievable driving him constantly back and forth. Um, it's extremely difficult for my all these years. And, um, and his close friends, like uh, Eo Marias, like, the best, best friend we could ever have in the uh, I'm so happy that Eo Karen and to all of these other friends that we've always uh, provided such great company and, and with him. Uh, I'm sure he thanks you more than anyone. Uh, so everybody, I have plenty more to say, but I, I might uh, just uh, ramble a bit at this point. So let's leave it, and uh, I will hope you should uh, put your glasses to the air. And to Yorgos, to Georgia, to a wonderful life. Thank you, guys. Thank you.